Well, good morning, Real Life. I am so excited to be here. There's so much energy today. It's fun to be down there worshiping alongside of Sean and you guys. I'm so excited just to speak to you today. I really believe that God has a specific calling for you, and I think today he's going to speak something really significant into your life like he has been in mind preparing for this. Um, Just a quick note, I don't get to come up here as much and talk, but our journey of launching this church and everything from, you know, the very beginning when it was an idea to launching to growing together with you guys, I'm just so proud to call real life my home and to call you guys my family. I could not have asked for a better church to be alongside with, to be making waves in our community, to be reaching out and really making a difference, and that's you guys. You know, God has sent us the most incredible church, and I'm just so thankful and pumped to be a part of it. I love seeing God move amongst us and out in our community is really the best part of what we do. I do want to say a quick thank you to all of the moms here, and like Sean said, that's you know, the moms, the foster moms, the adopted moms, the step moms, the bonus moms, you know, people who were, have been a mom in your life when you didn't have one. It's so much more in motherhood than just the person who birthed you, but there's so much encompassing in that. So let's just celebrate all of the moms in our life today. Give them a hand. Before we jump in, I do want to add another quick plug for life groups. I love getting to lead our life group leaders and coach them, and it is really, truly the best part of what we do here. You are not going to want to miss getting connected this summer. Life group change doesn't stop over the summer. We love doing that. And our group leaders seriously are what make it the best to do. They love you. They love people. They love having fun together. So you are not going to want to miss next week to get the chance to see more about our groups, meet them, and get connected. And then my last little bit of announcement, I do want to let you know if you've been worried, Sean's been worried that I might take this opportunity to poke some fun at him now that the the roles have changed a little bit. And he's been super nice all week, you know, making sure to really serve me and make sure that I'm doing good. But it's not going to matter because I'm still going to tell some funny stories and show some funny pictures about Sean today. So if that's what you came for, you're going to get some of that. (laughs) But in all seriousness... We don't get to do it as much because he's always up here talking, but I want to take a second to honor Sean. His vision, his passion, his leadership, and getting to see that behind the scenes, he bleeds this place. He bleeds the kingdom, wanting to see our community come to know their real life and purpose in Jesus. And so without his passion and leadership, we wouldn't be here. And I just truly believe in him. I love you, babe. Thanks for all you do. So let's give Sean a hand today. So as we continue in 1 Peter, not only is this my first time to speak, but I get to try to tie into Sean's series, so um, I'm really excited about it. This idea that's really cool is this idea of calling that kind of goes throughout the entire book of 1 Peter. It's, you know, being called, and I think, you think about being called, it's something that kind of, it emboldens you, you know, I've been called to this, I stand a little taller, I have a little more confidence. It encourages me to go out and do something, it empowers me to say, I'm not just me doing this. I've been called to do this, you know? And it's kind of a cool idea. It really builds some anticipation in your life, like I've been called, now what? And that really takes me back to my freshman year of high school when I was I was called and I was I was set apart and anointed to be the drum major of the marching band. Yes, (laughs) that's right. Not just a member of probably the nerdiest organization in the high school, but I was called to be their leader. (laughs) Um, It was a lot of fun. We did a lot of good stuff. I've got a picture here for you can see me, one of my senior pictures in all of my drum major glory. I'll make fun of myself as well, but it was more than just a title. You know, I got to lead my peers in different things that we did in marching band stuff. Um, I got to help organize band camps, and I got to help discipline those who showed up late to practice with arm circles and things like that. I got to assist the band director with anything that he needed to do. And the job was not without benefits. As you can see, I got to wear a really cool shiny feather called a plume. Um, I had my own whistle so I could give people commands on the field and when we did parades and stuff. I got to wear sequins on a regular basis. So that is always a benefit. Um, And I even had, and I brought with us today for 
had my own mace, is what this is called. So without a doubt, if you are not sure who is leading this long stream of nerds marching down the street in the parade, it was me. I was the person. So Sean said he might come up here and do a little mace routine or something with this, but we'll spare you that for sure. Um, but one of the nerds that I did get the privilege to know in band was Sean. Um, that's where we met. <laughs> Um, he was a year younger than me in school, and so actually the next year he became drum major as well, and that's how we became good friends kind of throughout high school. Um, and so I do want you to check out this picture from my senior year of us nerding together. <laughs> that's right. This is good, good stuff. Look at that guy. <laughs> Even he got married, so it's okay. You know, there's hope for single people. <laughs> No, but for sure the only thing that could have convinced a 16-year-old Sean to wear sequins and this on a regular basis was a calling. A calling emboldens you, right? So I think there's three types of calling in your life. And the first one is that you are called to trust Christ. I think this is the big calling God's given this to everybody. It's a moment that you believe that Jesus died for you. And when I was 14 years old, I went to a youth retreat. I heard the gospel that Jesus died and rose again for me. And I was challenged to trust Jesus with my life. And I really made that decision. I don't want to spend my life apart from God and apart from what he has for me. So I made that decision. The same way you are also called to trust Christ. It's the first calling we have. The second type of calling is a calling to a temporary assignment. And a lot of times when we think of being called, this is kind of what we think about. Um, I obviously was called to be drum major of the band. I have other callings in my life as well, too. I've been called to be a mom. I've been called to a career as a nurse. I've been called to go on missions trips or to give to certain causes that, you know, felt God put on my heart and things like that. And so when we think of a calling, a lot of times we think of this thing. But I want to challenge you today. I think there's a third type of calling that we don't think of as much, you know? And I think that that is that you are called to live differently. This is a daily calling. This isn't just a one-time event, something we do. And a lot of times we think of that, something I do or a task I have or a job or a title. But I believe that God will call you to a who before he calls you to a do. God calls you to who you are and your character and who he's developing you to be will develop your calling and the position and the things he has for you to do. Because when you know who you are, you'll know what you're called to do. So when you know who you are, you'll know what you're called to do. So we look in 1 Peter, I think he has some really good stuff talking about this idea of calling in our life. Peter was writing to first century Christians, um, as we've kind of learned throughout this series. And these were people that the world hated. They didn't understand them. They thought that they were weird. Sometimes we get some of that now, but honestly, like this was like a whole new level where like the leadership of their community was saying like, hey, these people are the reason why all bad things are happening to you. They may even thought like they were so misunderstood. They had um, different times and they're like, hey, their leader said, take my body and eat of it. And they're like, they must be cannibals, you know? And they said, hey, I love your brother and love your sister. And they're like, is this incest? Like the community really around them hated them. They didn't understand them. They felt alone. They felt isolated. And it was really in that environment that the people Peter was writing to may have been tempted to forget who they were as Jesus followers. It's easy to hear those voices and go, well, who am I? Am I able to do this? Can I follow God? And I think it's really cool when we look through, before Peter told them what they were called to do, he reminded them who they were. We also have to know as Jesus followers who we are. And so who are you? So let's look in 1 Peter 2, 9. He starts to tell us who we are. And it says, For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, and God's very own possession. When you follow Jesus, you are chosen by God to be in his family. You are a royal priest. That means you've been set apart to serve and minister to those early Christians. That would have meant so much because the priesthood was so important to them. You are filled with the same spirit that filled Christ from the dead. You're a holy nation. You're not alone following Jesus. You're a part of something bigger and a bigger movement of God because you are people who belong to God. And it's so good to say, like, who am I? Like, I'm all these things. God has told me who I am. And then Peter goes on in the same verse. He says, as a result, so when I know who I am, I know what to do. 
As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. We've been called, we've been chosen. God's already said we're not in darkness anymore. When we follow him, we're in light, we're new, we're transformed, we've been set apart. We've been called. And so when you know who you are, you'll recognize what you're called to do. And I wanna tell you a quick story about um, how who I am or who I was changed what I did. And so in my life, like I said, I wear a lot of hats. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I am a nurse, I am a church planter, I am a Jesus follower, I'm a worshiper, I do lots of things, lots of hats. Um, and there's also been times where I've been not things, you know, that I have been not a mom, I've been a foster mom, I've been an adopted mom, I've actually been a biological mom. Um, and I know that just as a little disclaimer that Mother's Day can be kind of weighty sometimes, sometimes kind of hard. And it's this great celebration of these people who have poured into our lives and cared us and loved about us. But there's also this other side of people who are desperately seeking motherhood and don't have answers, and I've been there. Um, there are people who have lost children, you know, born and unborn to heaven. There are people who have broken relationships with their mom or their children, or there's people who have lost their mom or never even knew their mom. And so thinking through this, I think of all the hats that I've worn in my life, sometimes my journey of motherhood has felt kind of the most misshapen. It didn't always fit right. I didn't always understand the purpose of that hat. But in our life, in our second year of marriage, so we were newlyweds, not much older than that picture wearing those marching band outfits, um, we had two teen girls from our youth group that we were leading who needed a place to stay. Like, hey, can we stay here for a few days? We're like, absolutely. We would love to do that. That is how God is calling us to serve. And through a lot of complex processes, we didn't know that that was gonna turn into us fostering those girls. It was gonna turn into us becoming a home for them, you know, becoming their parents. And all of a sudden, I'm like, one day I'm a youth pastor's wife. And like, oh, surprise, now you're a mom, you know? Kind of a fun deal with that. But one of the hardest struggles for me and things I wasn't expecting is that I think that process of motherhood and fostering and all of those things started to bring out like basically every insecurity in my life. Things I never even knew I struggled with. All of a sudden when I'm looking face to face with somebody that I have to lead and you know shape and care for, all of a sudden those things were just like, whoa, they're bubbling over to the surface. And I was thinking about it in light of these verses and you know it was really because I didn't know who I was. Um, and I didn't know who God said I was, and I was resting my life in my own power, my own strength. And through that process of you know, motherhood, and this wasn't like, a, oh, one day it was just okay, like it was a process that God uses to change our lives. I started having to face my own demons when I'm hearing that voice over and over that says, you're not good enough, you can't do this, this isn't for you, I don't know why you think you can, and not just the voices inside my head, but even voices of people outside saying, you know what, you're too young, you're never gonna be able to care for them. You're not a real mom, so you know you might as well just kind of move past that. And things that were really, really hurtful and hard. Um, and over time, I really came to this revelation that it is who God says I am that matters the most. And over time, God answered my who. And he gave me a verse that has kind of become my life verse of sorts, but through that process. And it's Proverbs 31, 25, tucked away in the midst of all these things that, you know, the good wife is supposed to do. But this jumped off the page at me literally. And it says, she is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. And so really looking through that, I'm like, what is the opposite of insecurity? What's the opposite of not knowing who I am? And God gives you that word, like you're strong, you're dignified because I said who I am. You don't have to be afraid of what's coming next because I hold your future. And there's so much power in that. I asked God, I said, who am I? And he said, I called you, you're chosen, you belong to me. As we continue in 1 Peter, he says the same thing in 2.10. He says, once you had no identity as a people, and now you're God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have God's mercy. And so trusting who I was in God all of a sudden gave me this boldness and this confidence to say, I don't have to listen to those voices in my head. I knew what I was called to do. So I want to take a second today and talk to, you know, the mom who's not sure if she's doing it right. And she's worried she's not loving your kids enough. You're too busy to do all the things that you want to do. As a mom, 
You are called to confidently and boldly show the love of Jesus. That's what God's called you to in your family and in your life. You love when it doesn't make sense to love. You give extravagantly of yourself over and over again. You serve faithfully your family and your spouse and whatever that context looks like for you. And you give of yourself over and over again. And this message isn't just for moms about what we've been called to do, but in the same way for all of us here at Real Life, I hope you know who you are today. Not just moms, but everyone. You are graced by God. You are loved extravagantly by Jesus. You are filled with the Spirit. You're anointed, and you've been called by Him. So when you start to have that question and that doubt in your mind, remember who you are, because when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. When you know who you are in Christ, you can show others the goodness of God. And when you're secure in who you are in Christ and what he's done for you, that's when everything starts to be different. Hence our series title. So let's check out how Jesus is calling us to live differently. In 1 Peter 2, 9, as we already read, it says, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful life. This translates into your relationships, your jobs, your purpose, your calling. Every part of your life is grounded in Christ. And so when you know who you are, you're able to show others the goodness of God. You start to live for him. And so how do you show people the goodness of God? After Peter showed them who they are in Christ, if you've read through 1 Peter, which it's kind of a good, you know, if you haven't, I recommend it. It's a really good book. But the whole rest of it is like, here's how to live. Here's how to love your spouse. Here's how to love people. Here's how to respect authority. Here's how to do all these things. But I started with this who you are. And one verse that really stuck out to me today, or not today, I'm sorry, earlier when I was reading through this is in 1 Peter 3, 8. And he says, finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and keep a humble attitude. This was such kind of an eye-opening thing for me because I'm like, what do you, how do you show the goodness of God? That's such like an arbitrary thing. It doesn't always make sense, you know, in like this abstract world. But I was like, wow, that's really, when you're looking at it, that is a playbook for motherhood. Be a heart of compassion for your family. Sometimes I struggle. Sean can tell you, you know, trying to be sick when your wife is a nurse is always a little bit of a struggle for, you know, getting some compassion. But God calls us to sympathize with each other, to love each other. And I think, you know, to love fully, to teach your kids to love fully, to love each other just with this unashamed unabandonedness, to be tenderhearted, be there. You know, as a mom and you find out where do I fit in at the family, you can be a shoulder to cry on. You can be an initiator of random dance parties and celebrations. You can keep your fingers on the pulse of the emotional needs of your family and your kids and be there and jump in in those moments. It's so important and powerful. And then it says you can keep a humble attitude. You know, I've learned with parenting teenagers, they don't always need to know that you're right. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way, but they don't. A lot of times they just need to know that I care and that I really, really love them. And so I challenge you again, when you know who you are, you'll know how to live differently. These things aren't just a checklist of, hey, I, I do this, I do this, I do this, I'm good with God. It's, it's something that's inside of me that grows out of knowing who I am from God. So one of the best parts about being drum major was that if anything had to happen, I was already pre-vetted by the band director to go and do that thing. So if there was an errand or a task or anything like that, then they were like, hey, who's gonna do it? Yep, the drum major got to. So one time at band camp, yes. Um, <laughs> we had, I had probably forgotten, Sean doesn't forget things. Um, I had probably left the got coolers that we used to fill up with water for band practice at our practice field. And we were practicing at our performance field to get ready you know, for the show. And so we got permission from the band director to drive back across town to go and get our got coolers that I had forgotten. And so here we are, we're driving down Woodson Avenue, if you've ever been to Raytown, um, in Sean's 1985 Mercury Grand Marquis. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, there's probably smoke billowing down. So we're on Woodson Avenue. It's like this windy, it's not a hairpin turn, but it felt that way when we were driving 65 miles an hour down it to get to the high school and back. And honestly, with the smoke flying out and everything in the window, the only reason I'm alive to tell you the story is because it was August and my legs were stuck to the vinyl seat, like with the shorts I had on. Like it was a miracle we made it. We rolled into the parking lot of our high school. We got there. We flew past the custodian. We had the keys. We went in the building. We got what we needed. We headed back out. And why were we able to do that? We were able to do that because we had been called. We already had permission. We already had the keys to do what we needed to do. And we were there to do that under the authority of the band director. We didn't have some question, why are these kids here? Oh, the band director sent them. You have the keys. And so when you know who you are, you already have the keys of God. You act on his authority. And that authority comes from his word. It comes from the word of God in your life that tells you who you are. It tells you what you're called to do. It tells you where you're called to go. And so what permissions do you already have in your life that you're not acting on? You know, I think as a mom, you're called to this. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God to do what you're doing in your family today. You don't have to prove to anybody outside of that who you are or what you're called to do. You don't have to have the perfect house and you don't have to have the perfect kids and you don't have to have this perfect career at the same time you're doing all these things and making a gourmet meal. You don't have to have this perfect Pinterest Instagram life. God is calling you to be you. And when the devil says you can't and you hear that voice that says you're not good enough, you're not getting it all done, you're not called, you move forward in life and what you are called to do based on the authority of God. You already have his past. You have who he says you are. And God says that you are chosen. You have been called. You are a holy nation of all kinds of Christian women and families and followers of Jesus. You have been set apart and you are on assignment from him to do what he's called you to do. So ask yourself, what do you already have permission to do in your life that God has given you the authority to do that you're still sitting in that open doored prison cell waiting to be released from? God's unlocked the door, but sometimes we have a hard time walking out of our own prison, right? So the real struggle that I had in fostering and mothering was that insecurity. I didn't know who I was. And when I didn't know that, I tried to lean into other things, to be good enough, to do good enough, to do, and all those things fall apart eventually. And I had to let God's word and his voice answer the question in my head, who are you? Not my voice, not Sean's voice, not the voice of people around me that I cared about, but God's voice and who he says I was. I have to be the best I can be following him because he has called me to this journey, to my journey. This is my story. Nobody else has to live it the same way I do. His timing and his plan are perfect. I don't have to wonder, you know, am I going to have kids? Is this going to work? And struggle through the things we struggled through. God says, I've got this. So because I know who I am, I know my due. Now that I know my due, I know I have a daily assignment from God to live differently, a daily assignment to show others the goodness of God. So when I'm not being a pastor's wife and all the other things, I am a nurse practitioner at Children's Mercy. I work in the ER. And so I kind of, it's this idea that you get to help people at their most vulnerable. They're having an emergency, they come to see you, you help them, and then they go home, hopefully, or they stay in the hospital. Um, and so once a month, we're on call. We have an on-call shift where you get to wait by the phone all day and wonder if you're going to get called in or not. We cover emergencies, needs, illnesses, things that come up, you know, last minute. We're there in a pinch. If something happens that day, I get called in to go and help. And really, if you think about it, I'm on call to care. I'm ready and waiting to be able to be called out and care for other people around me. And so I wanna challenge you, if you follow Jesus, you know him, you claim that in your life, you are also on call to care. We ask the question, how do you show the goodness of God? You're on call to care for your spouse. You're on call to care for your kids. You're on call to respond to those who are in need. You're on call to pray for that person who comes along your path. You're on call to give to those when you see things come on your way. And you're on call to be available should any of those things happen. And so you need to ask God to make you on call, to actually give you eyes to see the needs of people around you, to give you those ears to hear, to give you that heart to say, God, I wanna be 
on call. I wanna notice those needs. I wanna be there to help the people around me. Because when you know who you are, you will know what to do. I'm gonna say it again. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. And so I wanna do one last challenge for moms. Um, Through all this stuff, this has been challenging for me. It's been good for me. I love being challenged by God to, to really dig into who I am and how that looks in life. And so I want you to remember today, moms, who you are. And not just who you are, but whose you are. Because it's so significant to how you're able to care for and love other people. I want you to move forward today in confidence that God has called you and go out to love and serve with all you've got because that's what Jesus did for us. And so I wanna leave all of us with one last thought today to say, you know what? This isn't just for moms. Peter was talking to everybody. And I want you to leave here today knowing for sure that you have been chosen by God. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation set apart and we are set apart here to serve at Real Life Church and it's so awesome. You are a people and you belong to God. You are called today to live a different daily standard. And I want you just to leave you with a question to imagine how would the world be better today if all of us as Jesus followers took that call to live differently. And let's pray.